Welcome to the All of Christ for All of Life podcast, where we equip men and women to be faithful in every aspect of life. This week, you will hear a chapter of N.D. Wilson's Notes from the Tilt Whirl, read by the author. Tickets, please. Winter. The spinning begins. Snow is so overused. One sentimental, overly structured ice flake might have some value. But God never seems capable of moderation, or of understanding the basic concepts behind supply and demand. He constantly devalues his own products. Give me one flake, a cool room and a magnifying glass, and I will admire its artistry. But right now, I'm sitting by my window on a Christmas night, staring out at winter wastefulness in the extreme. Miles of clouds, clouds larger than states, have turned into crystal stars and now streak silently past my window to their deaths. Miles of clouds, clouds larger than states, have turned into crystal stars and now streak silently past my window to their deaths. Well, not quite silently. The stars are falling fast enough that if you step outside like I just did, you can hear the whisper of collisions and delicate frozen impacts, each six-pointed perfection complaining as it arrives. They told me I was special. There's two and a half bazillion of us in this hedge and more falling. Does anyone here care about overpopulation? A market crash? Close the sky. Lobby for a moratorium. But the storm whispers sound more pleased to me than that. Excited even. I knew I was different from the rest of you plebes. Look how silly and gothic you all look with your skinny knobbed arms. I'm unique. Neoclassical. Try counting the flakes. Really count them. I'll step back outside for a quick estimate. Let's be conservative. Assuming that we're in the middle of the storm, and it only stretches ten miles in each direction, ha, says the weatherman, and assuming that the storm is a tiny one hundred feet tall, and skipping the pre-existing ground accumulation, and eyeball estimating the frenzied blizzard's air content at a meager ten flakes per cubic foot, then we are looking at... 11,151,360,000,000 flakes in the air above a small patch in Idaho at one particular moment on Christmas night at the end of the year 2007. Just this storm, this tiny slice of winter, could divvy out 1,700 flakes to every person on this planet. More impressively, that number has the U.S. national debt beat by trillions. I look out my window at the proud Christmas tumble. Ye flakes... Do you care what I think? Hearken to my insults. You're totally devalued, like stars and galaxies and insect species. For all your balance and your beauty and your impossible symmetry, you're not even worth a buck or a cent. If I could get a penny for each of you, then I'd make the Forbes rich people list somewhere below the Walmart heirs. Just from this storm. Just from this corner of this storm. We all know that each flake is different and unique, because we've all been to preschool. Each one is beautiful. Yeah, yeah, we know that too. But how can we possibly value these things when their maker slings them around like so much trash? Actually, I've never seen anyone sling this much trash. Doesn't he realize that people will curse this tomorrow? That they'll shovel it and salt it and SUV it into gray slop? Does he know that my daughters are going to roll in it, melting thousands of flakes with their flushed cheeks and tens of thousands with their tongues? Dogs are going to pee on this stuff in the morning. They're probably getting down to it right now. So begins a new year, a new solar lap. Philosophers have long marveled at the world, but that's not exactly accurate. Some philosophers have marveled most, have responded to the overwhelming weight of reality with pontification and soft-boiled verbiage. The rest have just whined about what a terrible, hard, godless world it is. The world hurts their feelings, and so they fire back dissertations full of insults, calling it an accident, pointless, a derivative of chaos, occasionally even going so far as to deny its actual existence. But the world doesn't care. It has thick skin, and all the most important thinkers have become part of it. Should we care about philosophers when the world so clearly doesn't? Should we bother to remember the names and ideas of men who may live on as nothing more than a headache to college freshmen everywhere? Why wouldn't we want to? We name our diseases, interesting or no. We name schools of architecture, 
We name every novel, every play, every food, every ride at the county fair. These men felt burdened by our existence. They worked to justify and explain or destroy our presence in this universe, our communication, our ethics, our knowledge. They felt the need for a centuries-long game of intellectual twister, and they've ruined many things. Doesn't that make them important enough to remember? Like the chicken pox, each of them happened only once. Like the common cold, they build on each other and mutate. If you've been to college, you've heard of them. If you live in the Western world, you've played by their rules. Plato, the first true pope of philosophy, sorry Socrates, argued for a world of forms above this reality, a transcendent plane of perfect essences, pure and lovely where nothing ever gets muddy, including the essence of mud. No football. Many Christians today still think of heaven in a sort of default platonic way, and somehow manage to look forward to an existence in a cloudy spiritual world busy with harps and nothing much to do. Aristotle snitched Plato's pure, untainted essences and crammed one inside each particular object on our own plane of material existence. My desk no longer partakes of platonic deskness in the sky, but is somehow inhabited by pure inner deskness. And it is that internal purity that all desks share. It is that which makes them desks. My backache, when you get all the way down to its essence, is pure and perfect and ideal. If that sounds stupid, don't admit it. Muy importante, see? Just nod and try to look sage and a little conflicted. They'll still give you your degree. Plato wasn't the only pre-Christian Greek to inform Christian assumptions and mindsets. Aristotle has maintained virtual sainthood among many religious academics through the centuries. The theology behind the Catholic Mass hung on Aristotle. The unimportant accidental exteriors of the bread and the wine remain the same. It's that perfect hidden essence inside that has been replaced. The material surface is irrelevant. On that inner Aristotelian level, the bread gains the essence of flesh and the wine the essence of blood. The default mindset behind the evangelical concept of conversion can often become more than a little Greekish as well. Skipping centuries to the modern Enlightenment, Descartes the Frenchman had a little trouble knowing that he existed. But then he looked to the little engine that could, and learned that all he needed to do was think that he was, and he would be. Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. Say it often enough, be willing to help out other trains in trouble and you'll be fine. I think I am, I think I am. Descartes cogitoed himself, and the rest of the world, into being. Because of the mental ace he found in his mental sleeve, the modern world was built. Its foundation? Reason can get you anywhere. Leibniz, a bit of a Boy Scout, thought this world had to be the best of all possible worlds, since a perfect God could create no less. Easy enough. Voltaire made good fun of him. Even easier. Immanuel Kant wrote books with words like prolegomena in the title and thought morality was dependent upon and monitored by the ethereal laws of logic. Was dependent upon and monitored by the ethereal laws of logic. Aztecs thought they had to rip the hearts out of living victims on top of ziggurats if they wanted the sun to keep coming up. Shingles is a rash caused by the same virus that causes the chicken pox. A pig in a blanket is a hot dog wrapped in dough and baked. A tilt-whirl is one of the few carnival rides that appears to follow a random pattern of motion. Free spinning cars are mounted on a spinning and tilting platform. It was invented in the 1920s. You can buy your own for under half a million. Heidegger was a Nazi. Can you think of a better reason to pay him no mind? Wittgenstein was a beery swine, according to the authorities in the Monty Python Brain Trust. I can't believe it. Beeriness would have made him more readable. Nietzsche, a weak but strongly mustachioed Lutheran pastor's son, defined evil in the Antichrist as, quote, whatever springs from weakness. David Hume, the Scot, knowingly declared God and knowledge impossible without any apparent sense of irony. French existentialists, wise men all and examples to philosophers everywhere, killed themselves. Give me priests, 
Give me men with feathers in their hair or tall domed hats, female oracles in caves, servants of the python smoking weed and reading palms, a gypsy fortune teller with a foot pedal Ouija board and a goldfish bowl for a crystal ball knows more about the world than many of the great thinkers of the West. Mumbling priests swinging stink cans on their chains and even witch doctors conjuring up curses with a well-buried elephant tooth have a better sense of their places in this world. They know this universe is brimming with magic, with life and riddles and ironies. They know that the world might eat them, and no encyclopedia could stop it. I am a hypocrite. I grant it readily. I have read the philosophers, not all of them, thank God. I've been tested on the philosophers. I'll talk about philosophers, but watch my lip. It curls when I do. I hope I'm untainted. Every four years, I'll watch figure skating, but I'm no closer to buying myself tights. Marx called religion an opiate, and all too often it is. But philosophy is an anesthetic, a shot to keep the wonder away. What is the world? What kind of place is it? What is it doing? Why is it here? How do we know? The questions are fine. Sophia is the goddess of wisdom. Philosophia... The brotherly love of wisdom is a perfectly clean pastime for boys and girls alike, but philosophy proper has become a place to hide, a place to pursue immortality through never going out of print, by being foggy enough that room is always left for discussion, for future dissertations. Huzzah for questions. Nobody reasonable dislikes them in moderation, but does anyone actually want answers? Is the journey the destination? Please, no. Let me out of your Volkswagen bus at the next corner. Would a successful answer constitute failure? If you knew the meaning of life, would you necessarily like it? Medieval alchemists had a tangible goal, and when they all died of lead poisoning, posterity could see that they had failed. Contemporary philosophers work to avoid tangible goals and wallow in the sauna of thought. Apply with strong enough reference letters, and you can too. Pay them enough money, and they'll turn Nietzsche loose on your freshman child. Exception. Socrates had his moments, though it would have been difficult to spend a Saturday with him. His greatest achievement in a tasteful nutshell? All that I know is that I know nothing. Everyone likes an honest man, but it didn't really stop him from talking. At least if Plato is to be believed. What is the world? A large, compared to most malls, moist, inhabited, spinning ball. What kind of place is it? The round kind, the spinning kind, the moist kind, the inhabited kind, the kind with flamingos, real and artificial, the kind where water in the sky turns into beautifully symmetrical crystal flakes sculpted by artists unable to stop themselves in both design and quantity, the kind of place with tiny, powerfully jawed mites assigned to the carpets to eat my dead skin as it flakes off, the kind with sharks and nose leeches and slithery parasitic things with barbs that will swim up you like a urinary catheter if only you oblige by peeing in a South American river. The kind with people who kill, and people who love, and people who do both. The kind with people who think water from the Ganges is good for them, and people who think eating the heart of their enemy will ward off death, and others who think that they can cure their own failing brains if only they harvest enough uncommitted cells from human young. This world is beautiful, but badly broken. St. Paul said that it groans, but I love it even in its groaning. I love this round stage where we act out the tragedies and the comedies of history. I love it with all of its villains and petty liars and self-righteous pompers. I love the ants and the laughter of wide-eyed children encountering their first butterfly. I love it as it is, because it is a story. And it isn't stuck in one place. It is full of conflict and darkness, like every good story. And like every good story, there will be an ending. I love the world as it is because I love what it will be. I love it because it spins and tilts. Because it's dizzying. Because of the night sky and the swirling lights. But I've run too far ahead. We should be more philosophical. Disclaimer. If you think the world is flat, I'm not here to convince you otherwise. If you think the world is meaningless rubbish bobbing in the galactic culvert of accidental reality, 
I don't intend to grapple with your ever so subtle epistemological claims. I am here to paint you a picture of the world I see. I have a clumsy brush and my tongue sticks out the corner of my mouth. I've even put a shirt on backward like a priest. I hope they're not offended. And now let's find Sophia and give her a little lovin', brotherly like. If we hope to answer such grand sweeping questions as what is the meaning of existence and what determines good and evil and who am I and is it all right to park illegally? Then we should start with something a little more basic, something that even scientists should be able to answer. What is the world made of? There are a number of proposed answers floating around out there already. The world, according to more than a few gentle people in orange robes, is an illusion. What is the illusion made of? Mostly suffering. George Barclay, an 18th century bishop, gave a similar answer. The world exists within the mind of God. We and this and everything hold our ontology, being, within his imagination. Barclay denied the material nature of the universe entirely. We are thoughts. Nothing but thoughts. Samuel Johnson, upon first hearing this new philosophy, exuberantly kicked a large rock, saying, I refute it thus. Sore toes are a compelling argument. Of course, the ancients broke the world down to four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. Fair enough, but what are they made of? I could buy a picture book entitled, What is the World Made Of? But I don't think you would get me past solids, liquids, and gases, our restatement of the ancient formulation excluding fire as energy. We built a periodic table, laughed at the ancients for being so simplistic, and named a barrage of elements. Elements are supposed to be things that are elemental, things that won't break down any further. Things like gold, lead, sodium, californium. But those things have nuclei and electrons and other smaller, trickier bits of business. Some contemporary thinkers start talking about dimensions, cosmic silly string, and other postulated unmeasurables. Einstein gave us space-time and a whole lot of bad sci-fi along with it. The current most cutting-edge mystics and physics departments around the world know the answer. Go to one of the research labs, get a sticker name tag, and hitch yourself to a perky cosmic tour guide. What is the world made of? Well, it's simple. Most of what you see around you is made of up quarks, down quarks, and leptons. Now you know. And if you would only spend more time online, I wouldn't have to tell you these things. Are we allowed to ask what quarks are made of? Can I Google that? How about leptons? The perky one continues. Quarks and leptons are very, very tiny, and when bonded together in different arrangements, they make up reality around us. We can't vouch for the farthest reaches of distant space. Well, what are they made of? The four types of bond that keep reality from flying apart like a microwaved egg are as follows. Strong, weak, electromagnetic, and gravitational. Strong? That's all they know. Don't we need a more impressive name if we're talking about bonding fundamental reality? Most of what you see is actually empty space or nothingness. The combined volume of the most basic material particles that make up something like a chair is only a tiny fraction of the volume of the chair itself, as you see, it's spatially extended in front of you. Uh, nice. What are quarks made of? Did you know that scientists once thought the cell was made out of plum pudding? Yes, I did. Seems reasonable. What's a lepton made of? Recently, scientists have created the blackest substance in the world. It absorbs 99.9% .9 of light. Uh, what are quarks made of? The next tour will focus on antimatter. It begins in 15 minutes. Please visit the gift shop, and remember, we are available for parties. I have no trouble at all believing in the existence of quarks. I'm told they are subatomic particles that make up protons and neutrons. I'm also told that no single quark has ever been successfully isolated and that they have no identifiable components, which means that they are themselves and are made from nothing but themselves, at least until we get better microscopes or learn to speak electron. But why are we talking about this? Well, let's run through what we know. I have an olive on my desk. It is a product of Spain. It was grown on a tree, which means that the chlorophyll and the olive leaves absorbed energy from sunlight and used that energy to attack the air. Carbon was harvested from carbon dioxide. 
The oxygen was released back into the lungs of Spanish children, and the carbon was shaped into leaves and bark and this olive. Like me, the olive is carbon-based. It is made of cells, which are made of molecules, which are made of atoms, which are, as we all now know, made of quarks and leptons, which are... The options are limited, but all of them present a problem. First, maybe quarks really are elemental. What are they made of? Themselves. Second, maybe they have components that we haven't identified, in which case, what are those new components made of? Other components? What are those made of? Infinite regress isn't possible. The world cannot be resting on the back of a purple turtle, 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 on the back of a purple turtle. It doesn't even help if you work in anti-turtles. Here is the moment of my amaze. The olive that I hold in my hand, along with its friendly minced pimento, this olive that I now taste and eat, that former olive was, on some level, made out of something that was not made from anything. There is another word for not anything. The word is nothing. At some point, that is the answer to the question, what is it made of? What is it made of? Nothing. And yet, it is. But Samuel Johnson is still right, and Barclay is still wrong. That olive had mass. It had savor and flavor, texture and temperature, and even a tiny fragment of pit that nicked my gum. It had a measurable amount of potential energy. I am comfortable saying that the olive is no illusion, that the material world exists in all of its toe-stubbing glory. I see no reason to wander down the long, lonely road of self-sensory doubt. That way avoids no difficulties and only leads to chat rooms, meds, atonal music, and cosmic loathing. It is a slow and painful suicide, and, in my opinion, it's tacky. We have come this far using only the sense our mothers gave us. Do we agree that matter, that my olive, cannot be the top of a material tower, an infinite inverted pyramid that stretches downward ever downward with no first floor, no foundation, and ultimately no ground? If we do, then three real options still wait on us. Bring them out. They've all been called Sophia before. Let them walk the runway and we'll see which one moves more fluidly, more intuitively, which is the most beautiful and has the best birthing hips which could have mothered such a world as ours. One is truth and shapes the world. One we will call truth and it will shape how we see the world. It would be nice if they overlapped. Sophia won. Matter is actually infinite. Where the regress stops, there is some physical element that is made from nothing else and has always had existence. This is the atheistic evolutionary story. The universe consists only of time and chance acting on matter. At some point, the ancient eternal matter blew up. And now here we are. Sophia too. Something immaterial is infinite, has always had existence, and at some point created the material world. Ooh, I like her. Every little thing she does is magic. Sophia three, Blend. There is some material in the world that has always had existence, and there is something immaterial that has always had existence. This is actually the creation story of most theistic and polytheistic religions. A god grabs hold of fluxing chaos, or their offspring, or their own thigh, or something with prior existence, and reshapes it into the world around us. Norse, Greek, Aztec, and even Muslim creations begin this way. Of course, any number of flavors and stories fit into these categories particularly the last one. People and peoples have watched the stars and made their choice, shaping themselves and their cultures in doing so. The choice is not a question of logic, though we may make it logically. We cannot boost logic to the level of a transcendent arbiter here. It cannot whisper the answer in our ear. Any knowledge at this level, at this fundamental question of origins and ultimate metaphysics, must come through something else. Welcome to the world of faith. Here is my lady, 
my picture, my philosophical account of an olive. I look around at the stuff of the world and I ask myself, what is it made of? Words. Magic words. Words spoken by the infinite. Words so potent, spoken by one so potent that they have weight and mass and flavor. They are real. They have taken on flesh and dwelt among us. They are us. In the Christian story, the material world came into existence at the point of speech. And that speech was ex nihilo, from nothing. God did not look around for some cosmic goo to sculpt or another God to dice and recycle. He sang a song, composed a poem, began a novel so enormous that even the Russians are dwarfed by its heaped-up pages. You are spoken. I am spoken. We stand on a spoken stage. The spinning kind. The round kind. The moist kind. The kind of stage with beetles and laughter and babies and dirt and snow and fresh-cut cedar. You are made of cells. I am am made of cells. My cells are built on molecules. My molecules make use of atoms. My atoms are mostly space, but the bits that aren't are called quarks. My quarks are standing because they're obedient. They've been told to by a voice they cannot disobey. For Barclay and Buddhists and most breeds of Hindu, this world is illusory, sleight of hand. It seems material the way the smoke plays with the mirrors, but it isn't. The world is Vegas magic. Pick a card. Kick a stone. There are no tricks here. There are no props, no prefabbed white rabbits. The magic is real, and I stand blinking on the stage because of it. I'm real. I'm heavy. I'm matter. Cut me and I'll bleed. But I'm not made out of anything. And if the magician, the poet, the word, if the singer were to stop his voice, I would simply cease to be. It's cold tonight, and my mind is too small to grasp the world, tired from trying. I could walk back outside and stare at the stars, those tiny, twinkling, huge, spherical firestorms, but more clouds have rolled in behind the blizzarding herd that only just left. Tomorrow, according to the weather prophet, these clouds will crystallize and turn into six-pointed haiku. Haiku like you've never seen, each subtly different, each capturing a different mood, a different beauty, each priceless, a divine word. If I were infinite, I could read and love each one. I could remember the dance of each flake since the world was born. But I'm not infinite, and so I keep a shovel for when the haiku falls a bag of salt to fend off the whispering storm. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the All of Christ for All of Life podcast. That was the opening sections of Indy Wilson's Notes from the tilt world If you'd like to hear the rest of the book on audio, you can purchase it at audible.com or anywhere audiobooks are sold. Merry Christmas.